Welcome to the StoryWorks Reading Series, a podcast for readers, writers, and readers curious about writers. I'm your host, Alita Winternheimer. This month, the StoryWorks Reading Series returns after summer break with a brand new piece of creative nonfiction by essayist, journalist, and writing professor Jonathan Heidi. I am honored to bring Jonathan's personal essay, Eastern White Pine at the Corner of the Farm, to you, followed by a conversation with the author about the intersection of nonfiction and storytelling, bringing your personal self into your writing, loggers, arborists, and generations of family, and much more. Grab a cup of something warm and enjoy this episode of the StoryWorks Reading Series. While huffing up another incline on the narrow Superior Hiking Trail, I glanced upward, hoping to see the slope level off. I had cut a deal with my legs, my aching legs, that they would get a break as soon as we reached the top. I crested the hill, unclipped my pack's straps, and let it crash to the ground before I collapsed in the grass. The high overlook near the shore of Lake Superior offered shaded forest canopy, and a cool breeze. After stretching my arms over my head, I sat up and took in the expansive view, blocked only by a giant eastern white pine that leaned over the basalt outcropping. To the west, first prairie grass and yellow moss, then a stand of young, big-toothed aspen trees gradually covered the rock. To the east, the rock offered the perfect vantage point to gaze across a dark green canopy of forest split by a creek's marsh. An exposed oxbow of the distant creek sparkled in the sunlight. My eyes followed its downstream path as it widened to the river and met Lake Superior, the focal point of the view's horizon line, sparkling azure water meeting cerulean sky. Near the edge of the ridge, the pine's roots curled like a fist. Warty and black, they wrapped the rock face before disappearing in red-tinted dirt. The trunk, a hulk of dark furrows and broad scales like liquefied mud drying in the heat of the sun, seemed to dare the wind to push it further over the cliffside. Each zephyr swished the fifty-foot pine's top side to side while the trunk held firm. I chugged water and removed my hat as a gust blew, tossing my hair and filling the air with a chorus of tinkering aspen leaves and whistling needles. The sonic relief from the city and its alarms, car engines, sirens, and jets overhead made me thankful for this trip's reprieve. The hiking offered a chance to focus one foot in front of the other, one uphill incline at a time, just making it to the next next outlook, a change from the brisk pace of the university calendar, the classroom lesson plans, the course management systems. Teaching had been a victory won after years of graduate school. An entry into graduate school itself had been a win, one preceded by years of manual labor as an arborist in the city, where I spent each day pruning, shaping, removing trees in the urban forest. Teaching had been fulfilling at the outset, Long conversations with young adults eager to change the world. Vibrant classroom discussions on the Afghanistan war and campus politics. Late nights answering student questions about pressing news stories. The past year, though, had left me with more administrating adjuncts and less office hours, fewer colleagues, and an all-time low morale. At the back of it all, my wife and I wanted more than just our two dogs and our humble house in the city. We were happy, yes, but we together wondered what our lives would be with the child toddling around the living room, a kid who might grow up and enjoy hiking, who we could explore nature with, who could be picking variegated maple leaves, flicking red pine bark flakes, smelling white catalpa tree flowers, tasting red mulberry tree fruit. I shook my head to clear my thoughts, conscious again of fertility's fickle way of deciding which couples get children and which don't. Be present, I told myself, sensing the solitude on the hilltop. I stood and walked to the edge of the overlook, getting close as I dared and leaning my hand on the thick, coarse bark of the eastern white pine, which stretched precariously over the cliff's edge. When traveling to my great-grandfather's farm, I have counted on an eastern white pine to show me where to turn. The woody beacon stood at the intersection of a long gravel road and the rutted driveway. In my memory, the tree is a true sentinel, alone in its gargantuan mass standing high above the surrounding forest. James Ware, my great-grandfather, probably planted the tree in the late 1940s after he took over the farm from his father. James was born on the property, he and his nine siblings. My sister and I rode to the farm in the worn seats of my mother's brown Ford Escort station wagon. 
After she turned off the highway, we watched the, for the farmhouse pine. Seeing the pyramid of green signaled comfort, as though the tree were a loyal friend who never left his spot, who always waited up, and whose directions were always correct. After rounding the corner where the pine loomed, my sister and I went on adventuring. We would feed the barn cats, joke about the outhouse, rock on the swing, and fight each other for some trinket found in the shed. We explored the empty barn and the abandoned, rusting trucks in the weeds. Inside the small farmhouse, great-grandma Marie worked the accordion back and forth while great-grandpa James sawed out jaunty tunes on the worn violin. We danced, great-grandchildren filling the small, orange-carpeted living room with laughter amid polkas. Our great-grandparents told stories of their travels around the state, playing in halls and makeshift stages with their kids as Jimmy Ware and the Ranch Hands. My sister's gleeful hand claps and my haphazard waltzing must have brought back memories of packed barn dances, where cigarette smoke mingled with hay dust, where boots kicked and clomped around the bouncing pine floorboards. We would finish dancing, eat, and then, if we were lucky, we would convince them to crack open old photo albums. Deep in one of the albums was a deckle-edged black-and-white photograph. James is in the background of the photo, standing on a log just off the shore of a lake, wearing a white undershirt, pants, and logging boots that nearly reach his knees. He has the torso of a lightweight boxer, his biceps defined as he grips a freshly cut branch. In the foreground, on the other end of the log, stand three wet kids, my great-uncles and my grandmother, who must have been about eight. All of them are smiling at the camera. James had worked in steel mills, blacksmithing, farming, but in his earliest working years, he was one of the many lumberjacks clear in the North Country. Family members talked of James' thick wool shirts and high boots. In his barn, we kids found the cross-cut saws hanging on the wall. They were the same ones he had pulled back and forth across the trunks of pines, maple, birch, spruce. The axe heads in the shed were dull, but had at one time been sharp as the names engraved onto their hickory handles. Biter. Dropper. Giant Slayer. Other photos showed James amid groups of men in flannel shirts, suspenders, and winter caps. They stood atop stacked pine logs. The logs were loaded on a sled attached to work horses. They pulled the logs to rail cars, which took them to be sliced up in massive mills hundreds of miles away. Much of the eastern white pine went to build the frames of homes in the state and across the west. Three 8x8 beams of pine hold up the structure of my house today. When I stand in the basement, I can see the saw blade marks in the exposed lumber. I run my finger along the kerf and wonder if, decades earlier, my great-grandfather chopped at the base of this tree, sent it to the mill, and imagined it providing shelter for his great-grandchild. I have traveled to Itasca State Park, where the Mississippi River begins flowing. It was less of a trip and more of a pilgrimage. After studying, after studying literature in my 20s, I had joined a crew of arborists in the Twin Cities metro to pay rent. My wife and I had a comfortable old apartment three floors up a brick building. In the mornings, I biked to a garage and gassed up chainsaws, coiled ropes, and prepared for the day's climb. When our crew worked a property with white pine, I insisted on being the one to climb into its scaffolded branches. I didn't get an argument, not because I was tougher or commanded more respect on the crew. I was an English major after all. Instead, it was because most co-workers wanted to avoid the pitch that oozed out of the fresh cuts in the spring and summer. The sap coated arm hair like varnish and made saw blades stick in the wood as if they were full of glue. Climbing the white pines always brought me back to the farm in pictures of my great-grandfather. As I clipped my carabiners and ascended into the tree with a fancy harness, safety lines, specialty pulleys, and highly dressed knots, I imagined James with a simple flip line around the tree, his spikes pinching into the bark. James and I both knew the thrill of a climb and a fresh cut. After climbing enough trees, one gets a special sense of which stems are strong, what discolorations or bark formations mean weakness, and even how a branch will flip through the air and land on the ground. And after cutting enough wood, one can feel the difference in the pulpy texture from the saw's handle. We knew the same sure bite of the hand saw's blade ripping through pine branches. We both inhaled the same whiff of sweet wood dust. We knew the feeling of needles brushing our necks while reaching out for the next branch, though perhaps he knew it a little bit more precariously. If the job allowed me to prune all the way to the top of a pine tree, then I would climb to the point where the tree's top bent against my weight. Those high points in the crown of the tree offered the, the panoramic views. 
sometimes classical revival church spires and deep river gorges, other times endless roof shingles on cookie-cutter suburban homes. How many old-growth tree chops had my great-grandfather reached? How much higher did they grow? What view did he have? How far into the future did his horizon stretch? At Itasca, I walked to Preacher's Grove, where red and white pines create a cathedral of nature. A small boardwalk off the road brought me to a wall of bark, the trunk of a white pine more than a hundred feet tall. I stood, all googly-eyed and smiling with my mouth wide open. I could put my fingers in the deep bark troughs. The closest branches grew three stories above me. Birds flittered from branch to branch. Chipmunks squeaked to each other. And when the breeze moved through, the whooshing noise seemed to surround me like an acoustic cocoon. The tree might have been a seedling in the mid-1600s. It may have been sprouting as indigenous traders gathered pelts and taught new languages to buckskin-bound French trappers. James likely stood near dozens of similar trees while wearing his Sawyer spikes on his feet. Where I saw glory, he might have seen board foot of lumber, and with it, the money to buy his family's foundation. But I like to think that he came to this place, stared up at this hulk, felt the same drive to plant more, to have something that his great-grandchildren could look up to generations later. On the ridge overlooking Lake Superior, I ran my hand along the leaning pine's bark ridges. Years previous, I had studied to pass an arborist certification exam and started reading about trees. In company meetings, we would be quizzed on safety protocols, but also on how to differentiate trees that appear similar, such as the many coniferous long-needled trees, the pines. I learned that the eastern white pine is distinguished among Minnesota conifers by its obvious dark bark and bleach-white interior wood, but also its soft needles and long cones. The immature cone of an easter white pine looks like a five-inch long gigantic green caterpillar with a body of large scales. If we climbed a white pine at the end of the summer, we could see each cone's scale tip white with resin. The tip, called the umbo, does not have a sharp end. Or, as one crew member who graduated from a forestry program used to say, there is no pickle on the white pine umbo. In a book that he loaned to me, I learned that it takes two years for a cone to mature. Then it dries brown and performs its slow, fecund act. As the cone hangs from its stem and browns, the scales yawn open and the seeds spit to the ground. The cone hangs on the tree for several more months before becoming detritus on the forest floor. The most obvious difference in the white pine, though, is that its needles grow five per cluster. Red pines, Austrian pines, jack pines, and Scots pines all have two. Ponderosa pines have three, but the regal white pine matches our human digits with its needles. One day, I earned credibility among the crew for pointing out that the white pine's needle is not round, but semi-triangular, which can be observed close to the eye after snapping the needle in half. And it flexes and bows, snapping only when pressured. In the slightest of breezes, the needle groups tremble, then wave with the branches. The air molecules vibrate against each other and enter our eardrums. We hear the singing of the pine, the song of its soul expressed the only way we know it, through air. James worked in the woods as a sawyer for a time. He could later be found in a steel mill off the shore of Lake Superior and boxing in gymnasiums in the city of Duluth. When he came back to his family farm, he met Marie Erickson, a first-generation American of Swedish heritage who was teaching in a one-room schoolhouse nearby. She happened to be renting a room at the farmhouse. The two lived under the same roof, and it wasn't long before wedding bells were ringing. In 1934, Marie went into labor, and James rode his horse to a neighboring farm, borrowed a car, and drove her to the hospital, where my grandmother was born. Later, they had two more boys. The family of five raised dairy cattle, grew various crops, and milled lumber on the farm. And they planted white pines around the property. Today, long after my great-grandparents died, the long, straight branches stretch high above the roof of the house, above the roof of the barn. But when I visit now, they don't look as large as they did when I was a kid. And when one of them was damaged in a storm, my cousins called me to join them in cutting its branches, notching its base, back-cutting at the trunk, and feeling the ground shake as it fell. I drove to different tree jobs with a rotating cast of crew members. 
A few guys were hardworking and hated reading, and one guy loved reading, but was decidedly not hardworking. He liked to drink his chicken noodle soup out of his thermos and sneak naps in the back of a chip truck. On one long ride to a job, he told me eastern white pines can live to be 350 years old. He talked about their roots, how their roots can take hold in sandy and thin soil and spread to three times the size of their canopy to aid them in standing firm through straight line winds. At 100 years or more, he said, their bark can shield them in smaller fires. There is evidence from logs retrieved at lake bottoms that before the 1700s, they lived to be nearly half a millennium old. My great-grandfather didn't live a self-supported life past 80 years old and his great-grandfather had little chance of seeing his 60th year. However, the average life expectancy in the U.S. has risen from 70 years in 1969 to 79 years in 2015. While our lives are getting longer, the Pines' lives and heights have gotten shorter. I have read that old-growth eastern white pine forests in Minnesota were 90% harvested by the 1940s. Today, only 4% remains. Where the pine was cleared out, aspen, white birch, and people moved in. A few places still remain for the curious hiker to be awestruck by wide trunks and towering conifers. Itasca State Park is one. The last 40 and portions of the northern BWCAW are others. I found a photo of James in a drawer several years ago after he had passed away from Alzheimer's disease. It took some time for me to recognize him as I brought the picture closer to my glasses. He's in a large wheelchair. His face is thin, his eyes hollow, his mouth agape, and strings of drool hang from his chin. A birthday cake with candles sits on the tray in front of him. When my great uncle caught a glimpse of the photo, he whispered over my shoulder that it would have been better if they let him die earlier. That's no way to live. No way to be remembered, he said. Then he turned the conversation to the years James and Marie cared for their kids, their nephews, and their nieces on the family farm. He also noted their care for the now healthy forest that surrounds the place. When I'm of the right age and my body or mind is about to fail, I will reflect on the life of with those closest to me, make predictions for all the younger family members, and then go for a hike. I'll give my family my house keys, a playlist for my funeral, my internet passwords, and the title to my car before hiking a steep ridge with no one's help, unless my wife is in the same circumstance and wants to join me. The ridge will be impossible for me to climb. At some point, I'll fall off the edge. I won't thrash about. I'll just relax my body. I'll enjoy the wind and keep my eyes open. Then my body will crumple against the stone and scrubby vegetation. At the overlook on the Superior Hiking Trail, I sat away from the edge but close to the eastern white pine. I folded my legs and craned my face upward to see into its canopy. I meditated on breathing and pondered what it might have looked like as a seedling. I wondered about its great-grandfather tree, three cones back. Was it still standing? Was it now lumber in a city home? Did it ever hope for a descendant tree? I spotted a hawk soaring in the distance and allowed myself to imagine my own kid with me someday exploring ridge-leaning pines. Pick a cluster of needles, I tell him. Count the number in each bunch. Feel their triangular shape as you roll them between your fingers. Now bend the needles in half. Breathe deep the scent. The hawk flew out of view and I returned my view to the pine. I spotted a maturing cone in the canopy. Its seed would soon be spread in the wind. It occurred to me that the, that the tree clings to the edge for a reason. It hopes its cones are gravid. It prays that when its umbos extend out, the seeds will carry on the wind. They will not fall at the root flare and grow up over the rotted corpse of the father tree. The seeds will fall far, far from the ancestor canopy, past invisible lines that mark one forest from another, past fences and walls, past roads and streams. As they twirl unnoticed through the air, its ancestor hopes that years later, another descendant will root upon another clifftop.
You just heard Jonathan Heidi reading Eastern White Pine at the corner of the farm. Jonathan lives and works in Minneapolis, where he writes about history, the environment, and technology. He studied technical communications at Minnesota State University, Mankato, and now teaches college communication courses. He enjoys running and volunteers at Minneapolis Parks. His writing has appeared in National Geographic Adventure, Rolling Stone, The Growler, Relevant, The Duluth News Tribune, The Mankato Free Press, and other publications. Jonathan, welcome. I'm so happy to have you on the StoryWorks reading series. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Excellent. You are our first CNF writer, and I'm excited to have you bringing creative nonfiction to the journal. Do you want to tell us something about your background in writing? Well, I definitely um, started as, well, I should back up. I guess my background in writing probably um, was sparked by a teacher I had in high school. He's a wonderful professor up there in uh, Duluth, and his, his name is Cal Benson. And when I was a high schooler, I went into his creative writing class thinking I knew what, what good writing was as a high schooler, you know, you, you think you really know something. And uh, I learned so much from him in the way he taught his class without rules and, and by breaking the traditions of a classroom, by just kind of opening it up and showing us what things were possible with creative writing. Uh, that really sparked my interest in, in writing more. And I had always enjoyed it, uh, but it was pretty thrilling to be in his class and to, to be a part of that. He brought in different local poets, and we were able to hear from them. And from there, I studied writing, but kind of went in more of a journalistic direction. And to me, uh, it's always been a really great area between what, what good creative journalism is and what creative nonfiction is. And I know that's always... Uh, used to be subjects of hot debate. I don't really think there is much hot debate about it anymore, but my wife studied uh, and got her MFA in creative writing. I studied technical communication. And so we were both doing a lot of writing, but in different camps. And so um, I was privileged enough to be a part of a great writing group where we were able to work with uh, each other and get a lot of feedback. And I would write these journalistic type pieces and, and the group would say, you know, I, I think there needs to be more of you in here. I want to hear more about you in your life. And uh, it was always really uncomfortable for me, but I tried to tip the scales with this piece and and be a little bit more transparent about who I was and how I felt about trees as opposed to just what trees were and kind of a, a journalistic account of white hmm. pines. <laughs> so it's challenging yeah. for me, but... Um, but it is exciting to to move in that direction. Good, good. It really comes through that this is a very personal piece. But before we talk about that, where where is the intersection between journalistic writing and creative nonfiction writing? Um, and I guess you could say in general, or for you specifically, or both, whatever you want to address. <laughs> Yeah, like I said, I, I've always felt there's a very gray area uh, where those two intersect. Um, you know, people were using the word long form for, they've been using it for several years now, but I remember hearing that. And in my mind, I was thinking the same thing as creative nonfiction. It is, it may be more um, less internalized research, you know, that emotional research that is more uh, prevalent in memoirs and and more interviewing, but they're still you know using a lot of the same techniques that that are coming out. They're using that narrative. They're using the um, they're looking at story arc. They're looking at characters. You know, you hear journalists talk about the mule um, finding the the one character who's going to carry the story, and you know it's very creative nonfiction. Mm hmm. Definitely. Um, you know, the personal aspect of this piece is what really drew me to it. 
you're not only our narrator, but you're also the main character. We get that immediately in the opening where you're on the superior hiking trail and you bring the reader with you into that view. You know, we see, we get the sense of the the cliff top and the tree with its roots grasping the rock and leaning out and that expanse of Lake Superior. Is that, you said, um, leaning into the personal is challenging for you. So is that a scene that came when you started to write or was that one of those revision uh, uh, challenges where you, you had to go back and find that opening? I definitely had to go back to to work that opening a good bit. Uh, I think the group, the writing group I was in when I started the piece, uh, they were they were they're very good writers, and a lot of their work is is more in the creative nonfiction that veers to the personal. And so I had written an opening that was that was me in scene, um, but it definitely wasn't something that. Uh, was maybe as transparent as it is now, where it's more of the inner thoughts um, and some future motivation. So I did have to revise that a good bit to get a little bit more of of a reason for the piece too. I think a lot of times when I write, um, I do that, you know, put it on the page, try to get try to get to the heart of it, but I might not be um, digging deep enough. And then through the revision process that digging really happens and I can see the vein that's, you know, underneath there and, and then try to rearrange and, and work pieces, work sections a lot more so that there's more meaning there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. As I'm listening to you speak about this process, you're using a lot of great writerly metaphorical language, like finding the heart, digging, getting to the vein, um, are, is there anything you can say about that process with this piece specifically, maybe pulling from the piece we just heard some examples to connect those dots for our listeners, who many of whom, if not most of whom are writers? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I had I had started thinking about the process of um, what it meant to have generations locked locked within identity and for trees that's very easy right the rings and the the large size of the tree are symbols of that for ourselves it's a it's a kind of the family tree idea and i read a great piece that um used those metaphors and it kind of harkened back to aldo leopold uh when he wrote about cutting through wood. There's a really great section in his book, um, a sand country almanac, a early great early environmental piece of writing where he uh, cuts through an, a log that's fallen down the woods. And as he cuts through with another sawyer on the other side of the saw, and they're going back and forth. Um, he's describing the years that he's cutting through in the rings. And all those things were kind of speaking to me and, and making me think about what does it mean for me to have uh, uh, a desire to know more about my great grandparents and also a desire to pass that on? And how can I relate that to what uh, my love for trees and the trees themselves regenerating? And uh, so I was playing with those notions and I started out with my nephew in the piece and we were hiking together. I'd been on the spirit hiking trail by myself and, and I've brought my nephew up there and it, I tried it with the nephew and scene, and it just didn't seem to connect to that main idea that I had. So I had to take him out of the piece. So go back and take him out and then try writing it as more of a, when I had gone up by myself, what those meditations were when I was thinking about what does it mean that we can't have children right now and we want to have children and um, what will life be like and how does that there's some aspects of um, just wondering about how that works in nature and who gets chances for that and who doesn't. So I think putting it on the page, reading it, um, getting feedback from people, recognizing that it's not, they're not seeing the same thing. I am going back, 
rewriting scenes and then hearing feedback saying that it, it is connecting a little bit more was very helpful for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing all of that. And I think this piece strikes a great balance between the, the in-scene writing, showing us the characters acting on the page and then the reflective pieces. And then also the factual or journalistic pieces where we're learning about trees, you know, and their, and their life cycle. Um, do you consider yourself an environmental writer? Is that primarily where you gravitate when you, when you find your subjects? I would like to be at that place. Um, I, as, as you mentioned in the bio, I'm teaching a lot. So sometimes it's hard for me to even take on that, that, uh, title of writer these days. But, um, when I do, I would like to say that I gravitate toward that. Um, uh, I don't enough to really call myself an environmental journalist because I, I read such great writers who are, um, in the field talking with the forest service and, and talking with, um, of course, right now, a big story is the giant sequoias and the fires in oh, California yes. and mm. their boots on the ground, you know, um, and of course, yeah. great writers who are out there doing that reporting. So it's hard for me to call myself that, but um, aspirational. <laughs> well, I think you earned the title with this piece um, and any writer who who has a career that isn't strictly writing, such as teaching, editing, you name it. I think we all struggle with that uh, balance of the amount of time we would ideally devote to our craft and our art and passion and the amount of time a day gives us. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Yes. Um, this essay has such a strong connection to place Minnesota generally, but the North Shore specifically, how would you describe your relationship to the North Shore and its important in this narrative? Yeah, I would. It's it's funny how sometimes we think about home or or when people ask us where we're from, we often think of a the house where we grew up or but of course where we're from is a very complex um, question where we're from many different places. And, and so, but when I think about where I'm from, I definitely think about Lake Superior and the, I, I grew up in Duluth. And so my high school was Duluth central, which if people are familiar with that area, it's on top of a hill, it's on top of the hill in Duluth. And when you get to the parking lot in that high school, it overlooks the lake and you can see for miles across the lake, you see the horizon line and you see the, the slight curve of the horizon on the lake. And every day would be different. Some days there would be fog rising off the lake and other days the sun would be rising and just glimmering off the lake. And uh, I didn't really, I don't know that I knew the connection I had with the lake until I moved uh, away for college. And then it was as though I was missing a friend and I would long to, to see my friend and to hear my friend and uh, the lake itself. And, and I'm sure for anybody who lives near the mountains or next to the ocean has a lot of similar experiences, maybe next to the deserts that um, that feeling that the landscape itself is a presence that shapes uh, somewhat some of your identity. And that's, I think the pull that it has for me, the, the forest there, of course, up North of Duluth and, in central northern Minnesota, also have that that pull for me. Mm -hmm. Yes, I I resonate so much with what you're saying, and I'm a native Minnesotan, but I did not grow up in that region of Minnesota. Um, although my family sailed on Lake Superior when I was a child, so I I do have a childhood connection to that place and. Interestingly, uh, I went to visit Carly Tressel, who's been on the podcast before, a writing friend of mine, and we were in Chicago, so we're on the shore of Lake Michigan, and she went to school there in Chicago, and 
you know, lived right there by the, by the lake. And I said, oh, do you feel the way about Lake Michigan as I and so many people I know feel about Lake Superior? And she said, no, she actually has the same feelings for Lake Superior that we do, that there's something special about Superior. And, you know, even with all of her lived experience there at Lake Michigan, it just wasn't the same. So it's kind of like, yeah, a little, little home pride there. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's yes. right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, now with this piece, you reflect on your great grandfather's life, his relationship to the North shore, his relationship to trees as a logger. And you've shared that profession with him though in a different way. And you've touched on the North shore and you've touched on, on family, but what about trees in this piece? They seem more than just plant life. They seem spiritual entities. Um, is it all trees mm. or just pines, white pines? And what do they mean to you? I, I do love trees and I found that I, I can talk too long when it comes to <laughs> talking trees. Uh, you know, for, for a while, it, when I was looking for a job, um, as I mentioned, after college and after I worked at a magazine in Florida, and then I came back to Minnesota and w- looked for a job, couldn't find one. And so kind of turned to what can I do that's outside to work with my hands, started climbing and pruning with the crew. And uh, it was just a job at first, but then it became kind of a, like an, I wanted to learn more and more and, and get deeper into it. Um, it was something that I, it, one of those things where you always have a passing thought, oh yeah, I'd like to learn more about trees. That would be good. And uh, it just became what I focused on for a while. And uh, it was it was always fun to be up in a tree. Um, every day was different. And of the trees, I, I don't know, there's something special about that white pine. And I think it goes back to what we were saying about landscapes and how they can shape identity. Of course, family shapes identity too. And and those two things kind of intersected with the white pine. I thought of that, the white pines on my great grandfather's farm. And um, in Duluth, of course, there's a lot of pines on the on the creeks and the riversides and, and in the woods. And so there's just something about that tree that that always captivated me and and uh, was definitely in my memory when I thought about the farm. And I think the more it stayed in my memory, the more I focused on it. And then being able to be so close with trees. And in a lot of ways, when you're an arborist, you you are cutting the tree, of course. Sometimes you're pruning, sometimes you're removing the tree. But you have to trust your equipment and you have to trust the tree. And you have to know the tree well enough to see those places where you can tie in, to know where you can't tie in, to know where rot is located. And uh, it's one of those jobs where you have minor injuries. You might nick yourself, you know, you just have a little band aid or something. Um, but there are no middle injuries. So it's either a minor injury or you're dead. And that, <laughs> that like big risk um, makes, makes each day a thrill. Um, it can make each day a thrill. Of course, you're always safe when you're working with a good crew. Uh, but also, you know, it kind of, it feeds something, I think, for a lot of people too. It's it's about knowing this giant plant well enough to know what's safe and what's not risky, but also living with the knowledge that you might not know. And there might be some place in this tree where you just don't expect it and you could, the branch could break and you could fall. So. Um, all that to say, when you're working as an arborist, you really learn to to trust certain feelings that you have about um, the tree itself, and you kind of get this affinity, I think, for for these plants. Mm-hmm. And and for for me, the white pine was definitely the one that took the biggest place in my heart. We have a way of doing this, right? As people, we assess, a, we categorize a whole bunch of things. And then we say of this category, one is the most important. And we all do this as states. We have a state tree. It's the red pine in Minnesota. Every mm. every state has their own tree that they've selected to say, this gives us pride 
um, maybe it's an industrial thing, right, for a while. But mm -hmm. then as the industry is not as important as it was, it just becomes a little bit more of an identity thing. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. It is interesting. Yeah. And it sounds like in the work with trees that you're describing, a large piece of it is intuitive and a, another piece of it is reading the language of the trees, the, the bark, the pulp, the, you know, the different elements that you've discussed um, needing to be aware of and having a, a sense of as you work with the trees. Um, do you think that the white pine should be our state tree? Or did they get it wrong <laughs> when they gave it to the red pine? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I, they, I'm sure they take into account ecological um, specializations of the dirt and the soil. And maybe that's where the red pine is. It's more specialized in the state. That could be part of it too. Mm. I, kn I know enough about trees to talk for a while, but I don't know enough as um, the great researchers over at the University of Minnesota who would probably have deep answers for that question. But, you know, uh, on that subject, I, it was in the exploration of this piece, um, I was exploring, you know, parallels that I might have with my grandfather when he wouldn't know it and thinking about what parallels might I have with um, my own descendants when I wrote the piece, should I be able to have them? Um, and and how might that change my own outlook? And it it really, I was thinking a lot about that too when I had read um, Sigurd Olson. And when he talked about being outside all the time and how city, dwell, city dwellers, you know, these people that are moving to the city, they're not outside all the time. And they don't have the same sense of nature that that he did. And he talked about how being outside as often as he was he could get to the point where he could um, walk outside and take a deep breath and know what things were blooming out there. He could, mm. he, it, it was like dialed in enough to sense it. And I had thought about my great grandfather and thought about his relationship to the land, to the trees, to the environment that he lived in. And if that was his experience too, and how far I am removed from that experience. Mm -hmm. So I may have many similarities, even just, climbing outside every day, but I was in urban forests, you know, he was out there in the woods, um, in central Minnesota and, mm -hmm. and that difference, what does that mean for my, um, understanding of, of nature and understanding of this tree who has its own descendants and its own ancestors? Um, and I don't mean that in a way to personify the tree, but just in the nature of time, that's so visible from, a cross section of the tree. Uh, how do I think about that in my own life? And mm -hmm. how does it change my relationship to nature? Right, right. The tree is such a perfect, beautiful metaphor for exploring generations and mm. lives lived. You were speaking earlier about cutting through a tree and seeing the rings in it. And uh, that, that piece you read that did that did just that. You have some really beautiful moments with your great grandfather. One that stands out is when, as a child, you saw the saws and the axe blades and the names carved into the hickory handles. There's a romantic feel to it. And of course, as a child, I don't think you necessarily saw it in a romantic light, maybe as an adult you cast that little bit of romanticism on it, or maybe as a reader, I project that onto the piece in seeing it. And then there's another moment that's maybe a counterpart to that when you raise the question, did your great grandfather, James, look at these beautiful, massive white pines and just see board feet of lumber? Or did he feel a connection? Um, did he talk about trees in his days as a logger? Do you have any memory of, or any sense of his perspective? I wish I did have more. Uh, my memories of him are, are quite limited. And I called my grandmother to fact check myself on some of these too, just to make sure 
<laughs> Am I, I got this right, right? Am I remembering this okay? Um, I don't remember, though, having conversations with him about trees outside of looking at um, his sawmill or um, some of the tools that he used. So I wish I did. Um, and I was asking my grandmother about the trees planted around his farm. Did he do that? I asked her. I, I, I'm not remembering that wrong, right? He he planted those. And she says, well, you know, my mom did most of that. But yeah, he helped. He helped. <laughs> so uh, so I, I don't have a great deal of knowledge about that. But I do know that the family um, recognizes the 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 surrounding area of the farm and the forest and um, the care of the forest that was taken. So when he logged, of course, he wasn't clear cutting. He was going through and selecting the logs that, that should be um, take, take, selecting the trees that should be taken down and leaving the other trees so that the forest would regrow. So I was chatting with my grandma about that. I don't remember him telling me, but, um, but she does. And she remembers him talking about that. So selective harvesting and not clear cutting which shows, you know, general regard for the forest health. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does it matter to you which way his perspective on the trees ran? You know, does it, would it lessen your sense of connection to him and to this family history if all of his choices were practical? They were just about you know, the industry or, um, you know, preserving the land for the wind breaks for the agriculture, you know, the soil health and such. I don't, I don't know that I would, I think, um, would it be neat to have had spiritual conversations about trees when I was young with my great grandfather? It probably would have been, but I don't know that I would ever expect that. Um, especially living through those eras of, of, you know, riding a horse back and forth. Um, to me, that's very romantic, but of course at the time it'd be very limiting. So I think the, the standards of, of what was, um, practical and what was environmentally practical are, are so different now, um, today. So. Yeah, good question. I don't I don't know that it changes much, but it did it was hard to write in the piece. Um really trying to address that and I'm sure some of the listeners out there have these challenges too if they're writing about family where they may not have had a conversation with a family member who's now um not with us anymore. How do they portray that? Of course, you do your journalistic work, your research where you're talking with different family members, but you may just have a hunch um, from knowing from that person. Is it okay to write that hunch down? It's, I think th for me, that's hard. I don't know how other listeners feel, but um, I don't want to get it wrong. You know, I don't want to <laughs> upset other family members where they would say, no, that wasn't like him. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I think there is some, there's a, that creative nonfiction way of of putting it in and, and posing it as questions and more meditative than it is uh, fact-based. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I think this piece does that beautifully. There's that one moment of, of, you know, I call it hedging where we sort of acknowledge that aspect of the narrative where you, you say it would be nice to think he saw this instead of that. So we, we get that, that acknowledgement that it's not um, strictly factual, this, <laughs> this sense of relationship. And, you know, you have that stunning and for me disappointing fact in here that 90% of these old growth forests were gone from Minnesota by the 1940s and today we're down to 4%. So I'll definitely be making a pilgrimage <laughs> myself or, uh, you know, I suppose a conscious pilgrimage because I do go, go camp and get out in nature as much as I can. Um, but it, it points to what you were saying about the past and the mundane reality of being surrounded by these forests and how they just had to be a practical consideration because you were living in and amongst them. Whereas today 
there's so little of that available to us that it is special and it's a special effort for us to go and experience them. And so for better or worse, we today may be much more likely to view these things with a romantic lens than our forebears did. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, and it's, it's hard It's hard for me as a writer to not dip into that spiritual language um, to talk about the trees at Itasca as kind of a cathedral of nature, uh, to think about, you know, kind of like a soul song of the pines. And, and maybe that has to do part with me. You know, I don't live uh, up in Itasca County. You know, I live in Hennepin County where there are wonderful trees, but it's definitely not something where um, I have to travel for a long ways to get uh, certain things that I need. Or So, yeah, it's, I think it can be an interesting uh, and important thing to look at these uh, small sections of old growth as sanctuaries where we do need to protect them. And, you know, now, of course, there's little argument about that. It's just how do we go about protecting them is probably the bigger question that people that people have and people are researching and trying to figure out. Mm-hmm. And then I've always been curious too about, and this kind of goes into the generations um, area that I've been writing about, but when when do we get our second crop of old growth? You know, the 350 foot, foot, foot tall pines that, or the 350 year old pines that are hundred feet tall. Um, or close to 100 feet tall. There aren't very many in our state, but uh, do we get to that point again? And what we're finding is that you know the pines aren't growing as long. They're not living as long of life, and we're living longer lives. And that that contrast was really fascinating to me. And you know, trying to explore it through generations mm-hmm. uh, was part of the part of the project that I had here. Right. And let's talk about the forward looking that this piece does. We've talked about your great grandfather and the history, but then there's also this uh, theme of what comes next, raising that question. And maybe more of the piece is looking backwards, but that is what we have. That's what we can see. Whereas looking forwards, we can only speculate or hope. And of course, along with this um, question of what's yet to come for the forests and for the land, for our sense of home, there's the very personal question of having children and the continuance of your own generations. Um, What would you like to say about that theme that's running through this piece? I had... I had thought about, you know, how um, fickle nature is and how some trees make it, some don't, and some end up on cliff sides, you know, leaning precariously. And and some parents will complain that they have kids, you know, and they have to deal with all this junk. And at the time, my wife and I were really hoping to have children and, and really struggling in that process. And so um, that really made me kind of bore down on that idea and and uh yeah it's i know there's a lot of writing about infertility and i was hoping to take it in a a little bit of a different angle than than some of the writing that was already out there so that's kind of where i was going with that but it is again with with my background in writing it was very <laughs> challenging for me to to put that in and uh and not feel that it was sticking out like a sore thumb to come back to it even and address it again to try to tie it back into the piece. Even though a huge part of the motivation for me writing had to do with it. And uh, that is a, I'm sure a challenge for a lot of writers. It's definitely a challenge for me that that ultimate um, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest reasons for me to write the piece was one of the most challenging things for me to get into the piece. Mm. Mm, Yes. Yeah. And it's so well done, but it's presence is subtle. You know, it's, it's 
in the reflective moments at the beginning and then beautifully at the end, but it's part of a larger theme of reflecting on generations and continuance, um, progeny, the trees. It's what are you happy with how the piece turned out and its role in that piece, knowing that you struggled with getting it in there? I have a hard time feeling pieces are complete. Um, and for this, it, it still does feel a little challenging to not want to keep tweaking it, but I, I understand, you know, <laughs> been doing this long enough to know that you, you have to loosen your grip and, and let things go, let them into the wind and, and move on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Is it, do you feel exposed writing a piece like this? You've talked a little bit about journalistic type of nonfiction and uh, memoir type of nonfiction, both being creative and, you know, having that, that gray space between them. And at the beginning, you mentioned that this was, it was hard to put yourself on the page. And I imagine many writers struggle with that, you know, as a, as a fiction writer, if I turn to CNF, it's a very different process. I certainly start feeling exposed and second guessing and who would want to read this and am I doing it right? And, you know, <laughs> what? Yeah. Um, so can you just address that process perhaps for, for all of our listeners and writers and, you know, how do you go about getting over that hurdle and um, finding, finding the shape of the piece that's, that feels right for the piece. Mm, yeah. Well, um, for me as a writer, it's, I am helped a lot by the social process of revision. So having the multiple eyes that did look at it and, and offer comments. Um, and we had this writing group where we were all trading feedback. And so some of the feedback would, would conflict with other feedback, <laughs> which is always fun. So um, you get to decide which way you want to take it. And that was, it's so helpful for me, uh, especially writing something that's more CNF, having other CNF writers give me some feedback and, and let me know how it's, it can be totally appropriate to put yourself in the piece. And it is helpful for the reader to hear about where the author is, um, what the author is desiring and, and other metaphors that might parallel that. So the social aspect of the editing process was very important for me, uh, and and usually is. And it's a uh, it's the most challenging pieces I've written are the ones where I've had editors that are that are extremely uh, that aren't vocal about what they want, and that that tend to not be. Um, conversational about the edits. Mm -hmm. So for me, that is very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think such a great takeaway from what you just described is, um, you know, we often feel isolated while we're yeah. writing, but then before sending a piece into the world, there's that stage where we can seek input from people, trusted people, uh, where, we might feel a little bit exposed or vulnerable in that process, but it's ultimately validating. You know, isn't it great when people mm -hmm. say, no, I want more of you. This is so relatable. I identify with this or meaningful or, you know, moving in some way. Definitely. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of your listeners do have, do have those um, valued people that they turn to for feedback. And I, was talking with another writer one time who described their group and said it was, yeah, it was great. It was great. Of course, all groups are only great for a time and mm -hmm. they kind of come in and they go out. And uh, I thought that, I thought, wow, I don't know about that. Our group won't go out, but it, you know, it was a, it was like this really great time and now we can look back on it and we don't meet anymore, but it's, it was that great time where we were all kind of clicking and aiding each other. 
and then you kind of move on and maybe there's another group that that works or at least that's been my experience Mm -hmm. yeah that's been my experience too with with writing groups i suppose as we all grow as writers and as people things need to shift with us or we need to shift to other other spaces Um, yeah yep i agree yeah yeah now there is one white pine in particular that stands out it's the title pine the one at the corner of the driveway (laughs) um this piece at least in part feels to me like a love letter to the white pine Mm -hmm. which is one of the things that i adore about this piece do you recommend that everyone hearing this starts to see trees in a different way or maybe makes a pilgrimage to see a tree like the one at the headwaters of the mississippi i i highly recommend that i do there is something there is something uh really wonderful about standing near a plant that you know started out small and then grew to be so old and has we say seen of course they're not seeing anything but they are existing uh for so long and every state has their champion trees and their oldest trees and so i do encourage all the readers to find that that tree in their state and maybe go do a pilgrimage to see it we tend to do pilgrimages for landscapes right but not always for um something that might be growing very large outside of uh, maybe the the big stand that's like the largest mass organism i forget it has a name and it's somewhere out west but Mm. um different listeners will be just like tapping at the screen right now (laughs) saying the name of of this gigantic tree mass yeah yes all the roots connect i I don't know but all the roots connect to it so it's a single organism so it's like the world's largest organism the Mm. stand of trees so it's funny how we we tend to you know we want to go to the national parks where we can see the vistas and um which i also want to see but they're mm-hmm. the single trees that are large and and old they are also worth preserving and and hopefully they're within some sort of boundary that restricts logging and and yes. um suburbia from growing out mm-hmm. absolutely yeah as you were just talking i was recalling a point in the piece where you use the word cathedral um i think it's the tree at the mississippi headwaters you you approach it and you're presented with a wall of bark like a cathedral and you know there is a sense of spiritual presence when when you're in the presence of a tree like this you referenced um you know, it could have been a seedling in the 17th century. And then as you were just talking, I was thinking of uh, a time I was in France and I walked into uh, the cathedral Notre Dame de Bordeaux in Bordeaux, not Notre Dame in Paris. And just walking through the doors into the sanctuary, there was a feeling to it And I think, um, you know, without anthropomorphizing the trees or moving into like woo-woo territory, part of what we do as writers is capture the feeling, the essence, and then attempt to move our readers with us into that feeling state. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, and to do that in nature and not use um, the tropes or the the common metaphors is a really amazing skill that I aspire to. And uh, I don't know if you, if your your listeners have read Amy Leach, but her ability to write about nature in ways that I've I've never thought her ripe metaphors that are so fresh. Um, she's a inspiring reader or she's an inspiring writer to read and she allowed me to kind of open up my mind to thinking about nature in ways that i hadn't thought about it before she has a really wonderful 
essay about memory and how um, certain memories might be like animals that were in a zoo that had been let out and now they're in the wild and you might encounter them in the wild. So just a wonderful metaphor mm. for, for memory using nature. And uh, I'm quite inspired by her essays, which tend to be slow reads because of the way the rhythm of the language is. It's unlike a lot of, um, of writing that I've read. So I found her to be extremely refreshing. And mm. uh, while this piece is not, you know, um, it's not mimicking her or anything like that, but uh, I took a lot of inspiration from her when thinking about my own nature writing. Mm -hmm. mm. Wow, that's wonderful. I'll have to go find some Amy Leach to read and anywhere we find inspiration is so valuable as a writer. I'm always, I'm always um, hoping to imbibe <laughs> writing that fills me up because then I'm a better writer when I go to try to pour it onto the page. We'll stick with that metaphor of the cup. Um, and your piece has certainly inspired me. I am so grateful to have you read it here on the reading series. Is there anything you would like to add to round out this conversation? I do encourage readers to, to find, um, you know, inspiration in trees, inspiration in their even backyard trees, you know, um, learning more about the trees that are in their, their own area, their own physical perimeter. It's a, a it's a wonderful journey to learn more about those large plants that are, that live near us. And I think there are a lot of things that can be quite inspiring, especially when we're thinking about generations and, and how trees themselves have gotten to be where they are now in your yard. Uh, it's, it's an extremely long journey. And I think by thinking about that, we can, we can recognize the closeness that we have in maybe spiritual language or maybe just, um, scientific language to trees themselves as living beings. Definitely. Thank you so much. Where can our listeners find you? Um, right now I don't have a website up, but I am working on a website, so I should have that up pretty soon. Excellent. Well, when, uh, when you have the URL, we can add it to the show notes. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alita. StoryWorks Reading Series is open for submissions, and I want to see your short stories and personal essays. Then sit down and have a chat with you about your work and creative process. StoryWorks Reading Series is the podcast that gives voice to your stories and you. Submit today at storyworkspodcast.com.